Do you like coincidences? I love coincidences. And during lockdown, I discovered that I have a namesake, an amazing music halls performer called Jenny Hill, who was born in 1848. In fact, Jenny Hill wasn't her real name. Her real name was Elizabeth Jane, which is my sister's real name. And then, as I was reading this article about her on Wikipedia, I scrolled down the page and I saw a picture of her, and she looked incredibly like my mum at the same age. So, Jenny Hill, born in Paddington in 1848, just half a mile away from where my great-great-great-grandparents lived, became a very well-known music halls performer, and she was a producer, an artistic producer at a time when women weren't really very often. She sang songs with a political edge to them about women's rights and labour rights, but also songs that asked her audience to think more deeply, to be philosophical and to engage with their inner worlds, but in very straightforward, plain language. She had a bit of a bumpy start. Her dad was a taxi driver, a cabbie, a horse-drawn cab, and she started work at 12 years old. She was apprenticed to a pub landlord in Bradford, where she used to get up at five o'clock in the morning and spend her day cleaning, cooking and serving customers, all so that she'd be granted the opportunity to sing to the punters at night. And she'd sing until one in the morning and get up the next day and do the same thing. Funnily enough, I also started work at 12, but I was apprenticed to the Scottish lady down the road who owned the Happy Shopper, a little corner shop in my village in Bedfordshire, and singing wasn't part of the deal. I was saving up for my double bass, which took about five years. When Jenny returned to London, aged about 18 or 19, with a baby in tow and having lost track of her acrobat husband, whose performing name was Jean Pasteur, she tried to get work as a performer, and she really struggled, despite having developed this wonderful presence and voice. But by sheer graft, persistence and strategy, learning to work within the questionable practices of the industry, I guess, she became the highest paid female music hall performer in the city, which is where we differ. She travelled to far-flung places for a working-class lass to get to South Africa and New York in the 1800s must have been unheard of. People there apparently struggled with her London accent and her jokes. She went to many of the places I unexpectedly got to travel to as well, as a result of my own touring and music making. She had hits such as If Only I Bossed the Show and The Song of the Thrush I read in a PhD that I found called Reigniting the Vital Spark by Dr Lola Wingrove, whilst in fact I was staying in a cottage called Mavis Hall, and Mavis is a song thrush in Scots. And she sang about workers' rights, a real interest of mine, and specifically about dock workers' rights, which is a strange coincidence as many of the men in my family tree worked as lighter men. They carried goods between the ships and the quayside. They took their name from the process of lightening the load of the ship. As Jenny became more well known, she went on to try to raise issues of equality and inclusion for women musicians and often published articles in stage magazines. She had a profile and a presence. Kind of interested in the same sorts of themes as I've been interested in, like my big project, Songs of Separation, which was created for 10 women trad musicians and was quietly intended to bring attention to some of the issues experienced by female performers, all prior to Me Too. Like me, as a producer, she put her finances on the line, taking on impresario-type roles, and the workload took its toll as she battled to avert bankruptcy. But she wasn't deterred. At the height of her success, she bought herself a grand house called the Hermitage, which, when I read that, really kind of freaked me out, as I've long referred to my little flat as the Hermitage. I've even had this poster hanging on my wall for years, which was painted in the year after she died. L'Hermitage. By enormous serendipity, I spent the majority of lockdown here. There's a cool story to that, but that's for another day. I wrote songs, played instruments and gardened. It was a beautiful, quiet time, which gave rise to lots of new music. Inspired by Jenny's story, I reached out to the Norbury Historical Society, who provided me this image of Jenny's house. It became even weirder when I compared the image to the house where most of my new songs had been written. This, and a few other bizarre coincidences, 
gave rise to a feeling that Jenny Hill, the vital spark, was inviting me to think about a really important thing. How, in the face of life's challenges, do we maintain our vital spark? What feeds us and nourishes us at the deepest level? What makes the challenges easier to bear or even worthwhile? She's been dead for 120 years, but Jenny Hill has inspired me to take these new songs and work on arrangements for brass, strings, multi-vocals and more, and to create a community that's interested in feeding our vital spark, taking a look at what life throws at us and finding a way to laugh anyway. So over the next months, I'll be sharing some of these songs, the funny, the tongue-in-cheek and the sad, in solo format, which I must admit is a pretty scary prospect. So I'm making this commitment to the original serial comedienne Jenny Hill, who died in 1897, about half a mile away from where my mum was born 50 years later. And to you, good listener. And if you want to find out about more very strange Vital Spark coincidences and other things, please follow my socials where I'll be sharing some acoustic versions of the new songs. <laughs> 